Hello, everyone. This is your host, Asia. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of our last episode that I have a real pet peeve with turning the word October into, you know, some other clever word like rocktober or what have you. And um, I was just curious about how deep this issue runs in our American culture. And so I turned to the internet. And, and let me just tell you what I've found, just a few examples. Um, we've got marinas having docktober. We've got uh, online trading having stocktober. We've got Timex having TikToktober. Really? Anyway, since we at Classical Classroom are never ones to jump off of a bandwagon, we are currently in the midst of, wait for it, Bucktoberfest. Oh, God. I just want you guys to know I had very little to do with this. Uh, in this episode that you will be hearing right now, you'll be listening to members of the Catalyst Quartet talking about Bach's Goldberg variations and the composer and performer Glenn Gould and what he has to do with their rearrangements of Bach's Goldberg variations for a string quartet. Pretty interesting guy, that Glenn Gould. Anyway, hope you enjoy the episode. Send me your best uh, October manglings. And... By the way, if you are a fan of Classical Classroom, make sure to follow us and to rate us and review us on iTunes because that helps us dominate the dojo. Okay, anyway, enjoy this episode. Talk to you later. Bye. My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock, and I know something about jazz, but when it comes to classical, but I really want to learn. So, every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me all the way from the WFMT studios in Chicago are members of the Catalyst Quartet, violinist Carla Donahue Perez and cellist Carlos Rodriguez. Catalyst is comprised of some top laureates and alumni from the Sphinx competition. Uh, Sphinx is really unique, and it's aimed to develop talent in the Black and Latino communities. They've, uh, the Catalyst Quartet has toured all over the states and abroad. They've even performed here at Houston Public Media. And I'll put a link to that interview and performance in the uh, article for this episode. Uh, Carla was born in Puerto Rico. She started playing violin at the age of three and was soloing with the Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra by the age of nine. She studied at the Cleveland Institute of Music. She was recently a fellow at the New World Symphony. Uh, Carlos made his orchestral debut at the ripe old age of 13. He is an advocate for music diversity in the 21st century, and he's worked with all kinds of artists, including some that have been on this show, like Rachel Barton Pine and Awadaj and Pratt. Carla and Carlos, welcome to the Classical Classroom. Thanks. It's great Thank to be you. here. So what are you guys going to be teaching me about today? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk a bit about maybe performers as composers as, they, as that relates to Glenn Gould. Yeah. Glenn Gould. You know, we've never really talked a whole lot about him on this show. <laughs> but we um we did once exhume him from the dead for a Halloween episode that we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> so so you guys, so Catalyst just came out with a new C D called the Bach Gould Project. And it's all of these yes. Incredibly cool arrangements of Bach's Goldberg variations for string quartet, plus a piece by Glenn Gould. So, Carla, can you tell me uh, who Goldberg was and what these pieces are? Yes. So this story, we're not really sure how true this is, but they say that Bach wrote this piece called the Goldberg Variations for a nobleman who had problems sleeping. He had insomnia. Mm -hmm. And he structured it in a way so that it could end at any point. So the idea was that the 
keyboardist would play, and as soon as this nobleman would fall asleep, he, he could just end the piece. And the keyboardist's name was Goldberg. Mm-hmm. So it's actually kind of unusual for a piece to have the name of the performer in that era uh, over the nobleman. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. So I've always I've always liked the name of of these pieces for some reason and that's awesome I had no idea what the story was so (laughs) Carlos who was Glenn Gould and what does he have to do with all of this so Glenn Gould um, was one of the great classical pianists of the 20th century he's a Canadian pianist a Canadian musician and he sort of made his mark on the classical music scene with his debut recording of the Goldberg Variations and became known as one of the great Bach interpreters. Mm -hmm. Um, He has perhaps, as any great artist, uh, one of the most easily recognizable styles and sounds. Mm -hmm. He was very concerned with the articulations of notes, which means the, the, the length and the and the sort of trajectory of notes and, and organizing things in that in that way. And he sort of bookended his entire career with the Goldberg Variations because it was the first thing he ever recorded, mm-hmm. which ironically would then lead to the only piece he ever wrote, which is the String Quartet, which is also on this uh, album, um, which he completed about a couple months before that debut recording. And then the other uh, bookend being the 1981 recording that he made at the end of his life of the Goldberg Variations, which is the last thing he ever recorded before he died at the age of 50. Do you, do you know why he decided to re-record it? I don't know why. Um, we are so fortunate in the Catalyst Quartet to have uh, a relationship with Richard Einhorn, who was his recording engineer for the 1981 uh, mm-hmm. recording. Um, and there's oh, a wow. link to our sort of promo video about the Bach Gould project where uh, Richard Einhorn speaks on that video. So we got a little bit of information from Richard about Glenn and what that process was like, mm-hmm. but not why he decided to re-record it. I, I would say just from listening to the two recordings side by side, it becomes clear to me that in his first recording, he was trying to be a, a bit of a show, a show off and and mm-hmm. and showcase his virtuosity. When you listen to the two recordings, what I gather is just a life of experience that is then being showcased in the later recording because the first recording is considerably faster and the later recording has a lot more time taken and there's a lot more um, sort of, if you, I'd say music going on. Richard uh, did say was that there wasn't a single take in the recording studio that wasn't usable, that wasn't note perfect, even in 1981. So I can only imagine in 1955 that he was at his peak um, still playing well. I mention that because there's a lot of speculation as to whether he manipulated his recordings and like played them slowly and oh. speeded them up to be note perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, but he really apparently was that Amazing. <laughs> wow. So you think he just kind of wanted to make another pass at it to, to see I if he could do so. it even better? And, and I and I, f- I think that might be the case. And I think the nature of like what it is to be a musician and to like journey with music and mm-hmm. travel and meet people and have exchanges with different cultures, it sort of flavors the way you perceive the world and the way you perceive music. And I think that um, maybe just time, uh, you feel like there's something more to say that you didn't say the first time. I know for me personally, with this album, there are things that I would do differently. So I personally look forward to potentially re-recording the Goldberg Variations in, say, 10 years, 20 years. Um, Even while this album is still fresh. So I think the work is never done. and. Especially with the music of Bach, there's so many different ways to say what he has on the page. 
Yeah, that's kind of the curse of creativity, isn't it? It's like you. It's impossible to say everything. Exactly. You know, like exactly. you can capture a recording, you can write a novel, you can paint a painting, and it mm -hmm. and it's as close to what you want to say. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, there's there yeah. are two things that can go along with that. Like one is usually like young composers try and say too much because they're trying to sort of do everything that they know how to do and mm -hmm. show that like they're masters of this thing. And yet the the older these people get, the less they try to pack into one piece yeah. and they become more streamlined. And the other thing I'd say when it comes to visual arts is um, like painters, sort of the the true mark of like genius or, or being a great artist is knowing when things are done, knowing when the painting's finished uh -huh. and making the decision to just leave it alone. Yeah. But I think that's something that all of us struggle with throughout our lives. Yeah. Carla, can you talk about the fact that, that like these compositions, Gl Glenn Gould was a pianist. Mm -hmm. These, these uh, Goldberg variations are pieces written obviously for, for piano, but you guys wanted to arrange them for string. And this was, if I'm, if I'm correct, the first time that it's ever been arranged for a string quartet. Yes, that's correct. So, wh so, what prompted that? Like, what made you think, you know, what I'm going to make this for my instrument? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's a an arrangement for string trio and string orchestra by Sid Kavetsky that's become quite popular and famous. And everyone in our quartet grew up listening to Glenn Gould's recording of the Goldberg Variations, of mm -hmm. course. And one thing that's that's really interesting about string players is that. We spend our whole lives playing Bach from the time we're kids until all the way through school, really spending a lot of time with the solo Bach pieces for, for cello and violin and, and the violists play whichever they'd like. And then you decide to be in a string quartet like us, for example, and there no longer is any Bach. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so because Bach didn't write string quartets, and so... That's sort of a little bit of why we decided to do this. I see. You missed Bach. We won't. Yeah. You missed him. Exactly. You wanted to bring him back. Exactly. So you're saying that the, the Gould recordings actually informed what you were doing? Like, those are the recordings that you listened to? And so well, that's, that's why Glenn Gould is kind of tied up in this project with you? Right. Or, well, yeah. actually, it's interesting. The reason we came to the Bach was because we were researching um, repertoire for future seasons, mm -hmm. and we came across his string quartet, and we thought, well, that's such an interesting piece, and he was such an important person. Um, we would love to program this for the future. Now, how do we do that in a relevant way? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's play the Goldberg variations. Oh, there isn't a Goldberg variation version for string quartet. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's make our own. So <laughs> that's sort of... How that went, and yes, we were inspired by him and and his music, but ultimately we tried as much as possible to stick to Bach and his manuscript, and try to stay true to Bach. Gotcha. I was listening to the recording, and it's just, it's really cool. And I, I'm not just, you know, tooting your horn here. It it really, I I just immediately was like, this is so cool. And then you, you talk a little bit about it in your video online, like the particular way that you arranged it, like mm -hmm. one, one, one voice enters and everybody's kind of sharing the different parts. Yes, we, um, we really wanted it to be completely Catalyst Quartet's arrangement. So all hands on deck and we divided up the the variations mm -hmm. equally. I mean, we did pick uh, our favorites for the initial sort of bare bones arrangement, and then we all made an arrangement of the aria. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, since the aria bookends the piece, we we kind of put together, you could say, a Frankenstein version of the <laughs> of the aria to bookend the piece, and then we brought in our bare bones versions, and then that was edited by everyone uh -huh. in a rehearsal, and then that went through like I don't know how many versions until we finally got to the final version. Uh, so so the, in yeah. the end, some of these changed 
drastically. Uh-huh. And um, now we have what you hear on the, the album. This very egalitarian sort of approach to yeah, to like putting democratic them. and time wasting, but in the end, <laughs> everyone had their say. <laughs> Gould wasn't a big composer. Like you mentioned, he only wrote, I think, the one piece. So can you talk a little bit about that piece? Um, interestingly enough, the 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 folklore is, is tremendous about Glenn Gould, considering that he was one of the great musicians of his day. He retired from playing concerts at a very, very young age. Mm-hmm. And just wanted to focus on um, his recordings and doing his own radio programs in Canada mm-hmm. and doing some sort of short films and things like that and became a sort of recluse. And one of the reasons why he said he wanted to retire from the concert stage was because he wanted to focus on composition and writing music. Ironically, the f- only piece that has been published really of his, he wrote before he even made a single recording, (laughs) before he made his debut recording, he never wrote another thing after that Mm -hmm. um, that's been published. So he was a wacky guy. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, footage of him. If you go on like Netflix or YouTube or something, you know, there are great documentaries about him if you wanted to learn more about um, his wackiness. Yeah. Um, There's a terrific film, which isn't Mm -hmm. really a documentary, but it's just a full-length feature film called 32 Short Films about Glenn Gould. Um, And I think um, for classical musicians, um, uh, we being classical musicians, it's really interesting to Mm -hmm. um, know so much about a performer that you have admired. Um, because I don't think that there's a single other classical musician yeah. that has been more talked about and more um, s- has had more speculation yeah. about the and, and has more mystery around them than Glenn Gould. Um, and it's mind-boggling um, to think that the only piece he ever wrote was a string quartet. So being that uh, Glenn Gould was so obsessed with Bach, obviously, Mm -hmm. there are some Bach elements in his writing and the way he organizes the piece. And this example right here is a sort of start of a fugal section uh, where voices enter one by one Mm -hmm. and sort of come together and to end up four people playing at the same time, which is one of the more interesting aspects of the Glenn Gould String Quartet is that there are often four completely different things happening simultaneously, Mm -hmm. different conversations happening simultaneously, which is a fabled interesting thing. He used to like to go to diners and just sit in the middle of the the diner by himself and zone in and out of people's conversations. (laughs) So he really does write that into this piece. Um, There's uh, moments of chaos, but it's up to you to decide how to organize it as a listener. And you see the interesting thing is that the the piece itself shows all of his influences. You can hear, you know, you can hear the Strauss and Mahler, Schoenberg, you can hear Rager. Um, there's a lot of rich, um, dramatic moments. And then also the conversations we're talking about. Which is sort of like Charles Ives and his music. Mm-hmm. I love it. I- I was actually, I was reading a little bit about him. I, um, you know, had, had known a little bit about him before I'd seen videos and he's very, the way that he just sort of moved and talked, he would sort of not really look people in the eyes and he kind of held <laughs> himself in this particular way, you know, just, he seemed just very insular, Yeah. you know, um, 
who's talking at you in this very, very rapid pace. And the, the, you just mentioned the diner thing. What I remember is that he apparently went to the same diner for many, many years and ordered exactly the same thing mm-hmm. every single day. Mm-hmm. Like he was, right. he, he was a vegetarian and he ordered like like eggs and toast <laughs> <laughs> every every single day. But it's interesting to know that what he was doing while he was sitting there is listening to these conversations. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he did have these radio programs also uh, with the CBC, mm-hmm. the Canadian Broadcasting Company, where it was just like a bunch of chatter, sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> like just like white noise of people ch- like talking on top of each other. Department of Northern Affairs or whatever. But there is behind it a sort so the wife of accompanies her husband. And we tend she to say, probably has a Look, number of um, small children. We're terribly good fellows and broad-minded. We white. Wow. Uh, yeah, and and what I thought was interesting about him too is that he's so obviously he's sort of this very countercultural figure, but he very much kind of opposed the counterculture and kind of yeah. eschewed that. That kind of thing. In, in fact, wasn't that true with his his taste in classical music? Didn't he kind of poo poo like everybody after Bach or, or something like that? Kind of. He was a big mm-hmm. fan of the music of Paul Hindemith, yes, um, the great German composer, and Max Rager. But um, he, I don't think, was a big fan of 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 you know much else um, <laughs> except for the pieces that he played and loved and recorded uh-huh. why did he feel that Bach was special uh, amongst composers he he thought these other guys were I think we all think you. Bach is special yeah. in a way <laughs> um, but I have a feeling based on the way that he organized his yeah. string quartet gives us a window into um, what he liked about Bach yes. in the sense that it was, it's it's organized yes. very clearly and very methodically and it's very mathematical in the mm-hmm. way that it's planned out. Um, each section is is purely notated by a metronome marking and not any not any expressive marking. Mm-hmm. And I think that the great thing about Bach, I always say, is that he was the great synthesizer of music because there's you know, Bach and before. And the before is what Bach kind of organized and codified and, and put together. Mm-hmm. So I think a sense of organization is something that was tremendously important to Glenn. And that's sort of maybe where the uh, original affinity lied for him. Listening to this music, it really sounds sort of like ordered chaos. And it, it seems kind of like Glenn Gould had a real fascination with order and its opposite. And I can see now how that really ties in with box music. Yeah. Carlos Rodriguez and Carla Donahue Perez from Catalyst Quartet, thank you so much for being on the Classical Classroom today. I really appreciate it. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, everybody, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. You can also find us on SoundCloud and iTunes. By the way, if you haven't noticed, iTunes recently changed its settings. In order to see all of our episodes, you have to actually subscribe to the show now. Otherwise, you can only see 20 episodes at a time or something. It's a true story. I'm not just trying to make you subscribe. But, you know, do. And however you listen to us, make sure to rate and review us. You can also follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. Email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Triffid Holslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for keeping the hair gel industry in business. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing Betty Davis eyes. Thanks to intern Nick Dolworth for coming back to work every day despite significant evidence that he should maybe not. Thanks to Carla Donahue Perez and Carlos Rodriguez of the Catalyst Quartet for being here today. Thanks to me for saying words. Most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>